All right, good morning. All right, so today we're going to geek out about cyber insurance. Has everybody had a lot of coffee? Are we ready to start talking? All right. How many of you, and I'm, I'm, I'm looking into the bright lights, but how many of you are involved currently with the procurement of cyber insurance within your organization? Okay. Great. How many of you are planning to be involved in the future? Okay. So we're going to talk through kind of the new normal, that is, what has changed from really 2021 into 2022. We're going to look at a kind of an array of the experience. We're going to talk a little bit about the beginning, which is to say the incident itself and the cost centers we need to be thinking about covering. And then we're going to walk through the application process, our concerns about fraudulent misstatements and things of that nature. And then we're going to talk about what it is you need to do, especially from a security standpoint, um, in terms of being a participant in the process in cyber insurance and then also making sure that your organization has robust coverage. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the front lines, right? We know that ransomware is on the rise. We also know that it is um, incredibly expensive, right? These are a couple of ransomware notes. You can see we have the Paisa ransomware gangs note on the right. The other is a note that went across a series of public school systems. Um, blank public schools, you are effed, but it would hit every single computer and every single server. So imagine having to think about um, the costs of coming back from that. One of the things that, you know, obviously we think about when we're thinking about ransomware these days is really ransomware 2.0, which is to say the concept of double extortion ransomware. This is a PowerShell script that the Paisa gang ran, and you can see that they were exfilling data related to social security numbers, bank statements, and things like that, utilizing the PowerShell script to automate that process and take data that they could then later post on the dark web. So why do I mention that when we're talking about cyber insurance? I want you to begin thinking about the worst case scenario incident and then the kinds of cost centers and concerns you might have in that process as you go forward. So talking a little bit about this, you know, I am, I'm an attorney, right? I'm chair of a cybersecurity data privacy practice and I kind of wear two different hats. In one hat, I am uh, on the panel for critical infrastructure incident response, in particular municipalities, local government, state government incident response. And so I am a panel cyber attorney. And on the other side of the house for my commercial clients and the private sector, I am helping those clients navigate because I'm not on the panels for those particular um, insurance providers. I'm helping those clients navigate their coverage concerns, right? So I'm negotiating coverage from the experience that I have as an incident response attorney. And what I mean by being an incident response attorney is that I see every single statement of work that gets executed by your organization when you're in the midst of a ransomware event, right? So I know what is the, the most costly potential endeavor, right, and what isn't. So when we're looking at these particular cost centers, you'll see some things that are missing from the cost centers here, one of which is notification costs, right? So when you're thinking about an incident and you're thinking about, in particular, um, needing to notify a large number of constituents, one of the things I'd like you to consider is really the fact that um, the notification costs are not particularly um, major, right? Most of the time, if you're engaging with these third parties, like the Equifaxes, the Experience, the Krolls out there in the world, those notification costs can come down to as low as $2 per person, right, for running a call center and providing identity theft management services. So think about the population you may be thinking about in terms of uh, worst case scenario, if you lost a bunch of data, you know, and then kind of multiply that by about $2 and you'll get to where the, um, the cost center is with regards to notification. And so when I look at these big towers of costs, I don't see notification costs as being particularly high, right? Instead, the bigger costs are really related to things like interruption, business interruption, right? If your organization went down, if your uh, manufacturing line went down, if your, uh, your main website, your e-commerce site went down for a period of time, the business interruption cost would be what comes in to kind of make you whole, right? So in particular, uh, we want to be concerned about the interruption and restore um, particular side of the house. And restore, I will also note, uh, when I talk about restore, I'm talking about data restore, which is to say, you know, when you, bring, uh, when you bring a network back up from being hit with ransomware, obviously we're trying to come into a clean environment, right? Uh, we may have equipment that has been bricked, we may have equipment that is inoperable, but really also we need to be thinking about the cost of standing up a completely new 
um, clean environment, and that would be data restore, right? So when you're looking at a policy, you know, you will hear your broker potentially talk about, ooh, we've got notification covered, we got that covered. You should think to yourself, I'm not as worried about that as I am about the multi-millions I might lose for business interruption and restore. The other side of the house, obviously, is forensics. That might be where you have your Mandiant incident response team. You want to make sure that they're covered. Those particular costs would be uh, one of the things we need to be thinking about. Legal costs, obviously, you know, bringing in counsel to help you navigate the regulatory environment that you might be in. And then also crisis PR, right? Again, when I mentioned that we are dealing with double extortion ransomware, obviously these ransomware websites shame, have shame websites, right? And oftentimes what ends up occurring is that uh, the data gets posted and there are really um, bright, excellent news media folks out there who are following the shame websites and they will likely call your organization right away and we've had that happen even in the last week or so where somebody gets posted on a shame website, the uh, specialty kind of cyber media teams pick it up, then all of a sudden the organization is getting a call related to uh, the fact that they have these concerns. So really when we think about cost centers, we need to be thinking about the outside team, right? The incident response team's actions, which again, you know, you're thinking about your forensics, your legal, your PR, things of that nature, and your data restore. But really you need to be thinking about also, like I said, the below the surface concerns, right? Um, how are we going to deal with our audience, which is to say, who are our constituents? Are our constituents um, just our employees? Is it our, just our customers? What about the third parties that we have contracts with? What about if you have uh, government contracts, right? What about if you are, are in a HIPAA space, right, and you have regulatory concerns related to that? We're going to talk through some of those fines and penalties that we need to be aware of as we look at the application as well. All right. Let's see. Uh-oh. I'm having a little bit of... All right. All right, so let's kind of get oriented in some of the lingo here. Um, for those that are not familiar with the process, it goes through kind of a series of different steps, right? You have the application. We're going to look at these really robust, crazy applications that we're seeing in 2022. We also have the underwriting process, and that's where you get the, the team that works with the carrier is involved. You might have multiple teams involved in the questioning, right? Then once we get through that process, we'll start seeing kind of bids, if you will, and proposals. And we'll start seeing things like deck pages um, or declarations that would be uh, a part of the policy. One of the things I really want you to take away from this conversation is that you don't want to rely on the deck pages alone, right? If the broker hands to you, and again, I love brokers, they're, they're great people, but if the broker hands to you a deck page and says, here is your you know, uh, the base of your $50 million tower, this is what you need to be concerned about. What I want you to ask is, can you please show me the specimen policy, right? Because these particular terms in the deck pages of the policy have very, um, very specific meanings, right, associated with them. So you could have something that says, we cover uh, business interruption, but unless we have the policy that relates to it that kind of defines what it is to mean business interruption, we're really not going to know exactly what that entails. So then also, obviously, we have the claims process itself. That's if we actually have an incident, we notify the broker, and then we go through that process. Each of these steps, I would really encourage you to make sure that you're working with counsel, be it in-house counsel or outside counsel, but you want to make sure you're working together with counsel on these things. And we're going to talk about why that's important for the application process in particular these days, right? because uh, these applications are very extensive. The other thing to kind of get oriented on is the tower setup. For those of you who are not familiar with how your cyber insurance works, you may hear from your risk management team, hey, we have 15 million, this is just an example, we have 15 million in coverage. That doesn't mean you have 15 million in coverage from just, for example, Chubb, right? It means that you have likely, because these different insurance carriers are trying to allocate their risk, it means you have towers of coverage where Chubb might be the $5 million bottom layer, but then you have Markel coming in on top of that, and then um, navigators on top of that, for example, in our example here. So you actually have uh, three different carriers that you're working with to get your 15 million in total coverage, right? Usually the primary layer is gonna be the most important. All right, so let's talk about the application. How many of you are involved in the application process? All right, how many of you wish you weren't involved in the application process? Because, <laughs> right, right. All right, 
So one of the things I really wanted the team that were you know, here today to take a look at and consider is really the concept of fraudulent statements in the application process. Again, being the lawyer here to protect you, right? My concern is that whatever we state in these applications, it needs to be accurate, right? Um, and you will even see, this is uh, from the Chubb application that was filled out uh, just last week by my client. It says here, you know, the undersigned agents, uh, authorized agents, state essentially that these, these statements are, uh, are true and complete, right? Why is that important? Well, very recently, Travelers um, filed a lawsuit in July 2022 and said that one of its insureds had lied on its insurance application, and when they had an incident, they came in and said, we want to uh, terminate the entire coverage, the entire policy, and frankly, they were able to do that, right? Uh, they ended up having the policy get rescinded in the district court. And so that's why it's incredibly important that when we're filling out these insurance applications that we are making sure that these things are true and accurate. Now here's where it gets tricky, right? Because many of you may be dealing with an enterprise that is ginormous, right? What if you have 50,000 employees and 200 worldwide operations and locations, and you get a question like this? Does the applicant collect, store, process, control, or use, or share sensitive information? Great, now tell me how many records you have, right? How many social security numbers? How many healthcare records? Third-party confidential data, things like that. What I would like you to take away with regards to this is note that here, and it's very teeny tiny and hard to read, but it says, see attached supplemental question five response, right? Why do I do that as counsel? I do that so we get some wiggle room, right? Don't feel like you are obligated in these applications to be stuck to yes, no, right? Because obviously that's what happened with the, um, the, uh, the, the party that got sued by travelers because what ended up happening was they answered a question that says, we, do you have MFA across your enterprise? Check, yes. Well, it wasn't across the entire enterprise, right? So if they had filed a supplemental response to the underwriter that said, we have MFA, but it's on this particular environment, or we have plans to involve it across um, uh, additional spectrums, that would have been uh, sufficient, potentially, to avoid a fraudulent statement, right? So the concern here is that we really want to be thinking about what it is we say and how we say it. Now, this is another example of a 2022 application. This is for AIG. Now, the challenge here is, and if you haven't seen these applications become this robust, buckle up, right? because this is where they're going now in terms of what the underwriters, right, underwriters are attempting to do. So in particular, you will see that you actually have to go through and uh, designate the hosting services that you're utilizing across your entire enterprise, the e-commerce and payment services, for example, financial system services, et cetera. Again, if you are not involved deeply in that process and you're in the security side of the house at your organization, I would ask that you go and knock on the door of risk management to make sure that they're answering these questions accurately, right? Because the concern is they may be going through and clicking and saying, oh, I think we have this, we have that, but they may not know the full array of what it is you actually have in place. And so again, you know, the concern is we just want to make sure in this process that we're not fraudulent, right? That we're putting in the things that we need to put in. All right, another kind of concern here, and one that I always get a little bit panicky about, you know, a little queasy as your counsel, is on things like making statements like, are you payment card industry uh, data security PCI DSS compliant? Here, the applicant checked yes, when in actuality, the applicant was not, right, PCI DSS compliant. Again, before you make these wide sweeping statements in the application, I really would encourage you to reach out to counsel and figure out, do we provide a supplemental attachment to this? Do we give some additional information? Because then that way we can say, look, we are, and I'm not saying we say no, but I'm saying can we put some caveats on it? Yes, we are PCI DSS compliant with regards to these operations, but maybe not to the others. Now, the other thing I want you to focus on as you're thinking about the application process is now is the time that if you want to bring in folks that are not on the panel, right, and the panel is, uh, these cyber insurance carriers uh, have a situate, you know, have kind of predetermined uh, groups that they utilize uh, that you will have to utilize in the midst of an incident, right? So, for example, they may have a list of incident response teams that you have to choose from on the menu, right? They may have law firms that you have to choose from on the menu. At the time of the application is the time to begin saying, I want Mandiant to be written into my policy, even if they are not on the panel, right? 
Now is the time that we attempt to negotiate that, right? And if you attempt to come in after the fact and say, I want Mandiant, right? They may say, uh, and we're in the middle of an incident, they may say yes or they may say no. The likelihood is they may say no because we didn't do this pre-vetting in advance. So my strong recommendation is that you work with the team, talk to the Mandiant folks, and get kind of pre-negotiate that process together, right? And get through that process together. Okay, so let's talk about underwriting. And my experience in underwriting is kind of unique because again, I am not, I'm there as kind of a witness, an objective witness. Um, I participate in the underwriting calls and have participated in folks going all the way up to um, 100 million in cyber insurance, 15 million, 25 million, 50 million. When the higher you go in attempting to get those towers, the more the underwriting process is gonna become intense, right? Many of these, many of these underwriting calls can have teams of, of underwriters on there. And what do we mean when we talk about underwriters? Well, these underwriters are usually security professionals like yourself, right? So gone are the days when you used to have kind of cyber insurance, you'd say, ah, yeah, we got MFA, and they'd say, check, check, right? Instead, you're gonna end up in a situation where you're gonna get somebody on the other side of potentially the line that says, okay, really, talk to me about, do you have MFA on the backups? Do you have MFA here? You know, what are we doing? Is MFA on the 365 environment or is it on only on kind of the VPN, right? So really you need to be ready for those underwriting questions. And I would really recommend to you, again, if you are a CISO, that you go through some sort of preparation with your risk management team, with either in-house or outside counsel in advance of these questions, because again, what are we concerned about? Fraudulent statements, right? It's not that you're intentionally trying to say something misleading, but we wanna make sure that we're accurate and we describe the kind of um, array of what is occurring um, with truth and candor, right? In addition, the underwriting process involves external scanning. How many of you have been, have been scanned by underwriters in that process, to your knowledge? All right, one or two have raised their hand. Those who do not raise your hand, I will tell you, you are likely being scanned and you don't know it, right? And what are they doing? They're essentially attempting to do um, kind of a, a pen test light, right? And what they will do is they will share with you, hey, you've got port you know, 440 open, um, and if you don't close that, we're gonna put, build that into our exclusion, right? And so if an incident occurs through that open port, you're, you're out of luck, right? So we wanna be prepared. We may wanna uh, consider doing our own scanning to be aware of what's out there and be ready to kind of go forward. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about some real life uh, tricks and examples, and I wanna, uh, open it up in a little while to some questions, right? This is why I ask you to please pick up the specimen policies, right? Why? Because these are some of the tips uh, and tricks that I see in these specimen policies uh, when I pick them up, right? So here you can see that this was a $5 million base level uh, cyber insurance uh, policy, but it had a sublimit, and it's expected that we'd have a phishing sublimit, but it had a sublimit of $100,000. So you may be thinking related to phishing, right? So if we have an event that occurs through phishing, then what's gonna happen is in that claims process, the underwriter or rather the, the, uh, the carrier is gonna come back and say, look, this occurred related to phishing, therefore even though you might have a million dollar loss, too bad, so sad, here we are, $100,000 is your limit, right? The other thing that I wanted you to kind of pay close attention to is note the definitions here, right? The phishing attack was described as a means of fraudulent electronic communications or websites designed to impersonate you or any of your products. Well, wait a second. That's not everything that we're seeing these days, right? We're also starting to see impersonation of third-party vendors. So are we gonna be in a situation where um, if we had a third-party vendor get impersonated and we fell for it, is that gonna not be covered by the policy, right? So these are the kind of things that we need to be concerned about. Now this is, the uh, base of a $50 million policy, it was the base declaration page, and you'll note here that there's a lot of, of, a lot of problems, right? Number one, there was a sublimit for uh, legal, forensic, and PR crisis management of 2.5 million, right? Wait, this is supposed to be the $10 million base, and we've already got a sublimit built in based on the legal, forensic, and PR crisis management, so that is a concern. In addition, you can see that down at the bottom there, the highlight is the sublimits on the fraudulent instruction, right? What is that? Well, it's when we fall prey to a wire transfer fraud, right? And so again, utilizing my experience um, in the incident response arena, 
I take those experiences and say, wait, how would I try to get coverage out of this particular policy? These sublimits can be very problematic. And these are things that you want to bring up in advance to your broker to say, wait. You know, sometimes we might be able to say, look, this is a $50 million policy. I really want to see this $250,000 limit get raised, right? And depending on the strength of our application, we may be able to attempt to do that. And so that's something that I would really strongly encourage you to consider. The other thing I want to point out is really some of these concerns related to, this is actually just last week, ransomware sublimits in the policy. So this was a $15 million tower, and already you could see that there was a sublimit for ransomware for $5 million, right? So when you think as a business team that we've got $15 million in coverage, we really need to be paying close attention to these declarations and to these specimen policies to say, wait, we do have potentially gaps in exposure here um, if we're not reading closely and seeing that there is sublimits related to ransomware. So the key is that we want to make sure that with, we're working with the broker, and at the time that we're talking to all of these different carriers, that we're saying, look, Chubb's willing to do this. What are you willing to do, Markel? And if, frankly, if Markel's willing to go in a different direction or Navigators is willing to go in a different direction versus Beasley, well, let's put them at the base po primary policy versus um, a Chubb or otherwise. Okay. One other major area of concern that I want to make sure that you are paying particular attention to is, again, the failure to cover fines and penalties, right? So what are the concerns related to that? Well, how many of you are uh, dealing with any HIPAA data, to your knowledge? Okay. Right. So how many of you have privacy policies on your website, right, and potential California operations? Okay. So privacy fines and penalties, or things like HIPAA fines and penalties, or even PCI DSS fines and penalties, are things you need to make sure that your cyber insurance is going to cover, right? The concern here is that you have, um, for example, with HIPAA, an incident could be relatively minor, but could actually result in a two or three million dollar fine right? related, to, related to that particular incident. So make sure fines and penalties are covered. The other thing that I think is particularly important for the security ops teams in the room is the, uh, the new kind of baked in exclusions for out of date software, right? So are we want running legacy, uh, legacy servers somewhere, right, across the environment? Is there a need for us to do that? Are we not patching? The reason I raise this as a potential concern is there are now sublimits coming in uh, related to neglected software exploits, right? What's your patching cadence, okay? Because if your patching cadence isn't matching what it needs to be, you can see here that on this $5 million policy, you can see that it goes lower, excuse me, it goes lower than um, 5 million based on the number of days. Okay, or if, we're, if we are out of uh, the, like the 91 to 180 days after uh, a patch has been issued, all of a sudden we've got only 2.5 million out of that 5 million in coverage available. If it's longer than 365 days, half a, you know, half a million dollars. This is problematic, right? Because if you are running something, let's say that you have a particular type of software that needs a legacy environment you know, uh, in order to operate and you've put it onto an island and it's, we're doing the best we can with it. These are things we want to think about on the front end and then also potentially negotiate on the front end um, or at least make sure that the security team is aware of this and why we need to kind of move forward with our patching cadence. The other thing I want to mention is just war exclusions, right? Obviously the, uh, the war in Ukraine is a problem. Um, and with regards to the cyber market, because in particular what we're seeing is that um, carriers are starting to build in very robust war exclusions, right? Here is, a, is Chubb's example. You can see um, that if this was malicious, a malicious computer act committed or made in whole or in part or on behalf of a belligerent, on behalf of a belligerent, belligerent was described as basically kind of a foreign entity, right? What does it mean to be on behalf of, right? What if it is one of these, uh, you know, if it is someone associated with Russia, but is acting kind of on their behalf, um, but is not directly associated, these are things we need to be concerned about, right? And that's also why I would really encourage you to make sure you are, again, working with your counsel on how you report the claim, right? And that you're not making any kind of, of statements about, hey, we think this is related to X, right? Because if we lock ourselves into something early on, we may wander straight into a war exclusion, right? So these are the concerns that we want to be thinking about. 
Lloyd's was really the first um, to put out this. This was early in 2022, around February. Uh, they put out four different war exclusions, different variations on, on this. And it was really all related, like I said, to the Russian-Ukrainian conflict, with the idea being that uh, we would see a lot of um, uh, considerations like not Petra come into play, right? And so you want to make sure that you uh, are negotiating. Because there are different variations of the war exclusions, you may be able to attempt to negotiate around those and say, hey, I don't want Lloyd's 1. Can I get Lloyd's 3? You know, whatever the case may be, I think it's worth attempting that. And that's really my advice in terms of what it is I would recommend those of you who are involved in the process try. There's no harm in attempting to negotiate, right? Don't be afraid to say, well, can we get this or can we get that? Even if we only get 5% of what it is that we ask for, it's worth it, right? Okay, so in terms of our action list, and then we'll open it up to any questions that may be there. In terms of our action list, you know, number one is if you are a security professional and you're not involved in the process, if you're a CISO, IT director, you know, what have you, ask to be included. Right? Make sure that your risk management team knows that you're out there as a partner, knows that you're um, a valuable member of the team, and that you can assist them in answering these questions. Number two, we need to carefully review the application, right? considering the statements made, and consult legal in it. Right? The reason being that we don't need to file these applications where we are saying yes, no, you know, maybe so. We can really try to add um, Supplemental statements that can give us a little bit of wiggle room later if we got some things that are a little bit difficult, right? Let's say that you don't have MFA everywhere and you're really looking to put that everywhere and you've got plans to do it by, you know, Q2 in 2023. Well, let's say that, right? Let's go ahead and be upfront and say that because we may still be able to get the coverage that we need without making a fraudulent statement saying that we have it already, right? And then number three, again, request the specimen policy and negotiate it, right? There is no harm in getting a copy of the policy and then also trying to come in and say surgically with some precision, I want this word removed or replaced. I want to exclude this. I want to put this in. You know, I will make 15 requests of a, of a, of a broker and an underwriter, and maybe I'll only get five, but that's more than what was put on the plate for me at the beginning, right? So I think it's worth attempting that. And then also, number four, right, at the time of binding, go ahead and make sure that you add your requested incident response team, your crisis PR, and your legal teams that you want to have in place. If you don't do that, you're going to be left to the menu that's available to you by the cyber insurance carrier. Um, and if you can, at least go through and try to uh, pre-vet those folks that are on that menu, right? I will tell you that I have been, you know, 11 p.m. on a Friday night talking to a Beasley team uh, where they were trying to encourage my client to go with one incident response team over another, right? And, uh, you know, those kind of considerations and having somebody who can at least stand beside you as almost a concierge to say, wait a minute, Mandiant's on the list. They may be telling you that this is too small for Mandiant, but why don't we ask Mandiant what they think, right? Or maybe, you know, I want to go with this particular law firm. They're trying to lead me down this direction. Stand firm. If you have the panel and you want to choose somebody on the panel, go for it, right? That's my advice for you in this process. But if you don't have the right players that you want on the team, you can ask at the time of binding. All they can do is say no. But by and large, I will tell you when I have negotiated to have folks like FTI Consulting that does crisis PR, you'll hear from them later this week, when I've asked to have Mandiant included, they're going to include them in that process and you'll be able to utilize those teams that you want to use, right? And then number five, you know, know the claims process and when a claim is triggered, okay? Here's where it gets tricky because sometimes you might have something that is really just an event, right, in our cybersecurity parlance, an event that we don't know whether or not it's actually an incident, right? Um, make sure that you're talking to counsel and to risk management early on. Don't put it in writing necessarily. Pick up the phone and call them and say, I've got something. I'm not sure how bad this is. I want you to be included in this process. Because there are also, uh, we didn't highlight it in the actual slides, but there are actual uh, policy provisions related to notification. So if you know something uh, for a period of 30 days, for example, and we haven't given notice, we could actually be out of luck on our policy because we didn't timely notify, right? So the key here is really making sure that we know what it is that we're dealing with, that we get the right people involved early on, 
and that we go through that claims process with care, right? Because again, what we're trying to do is maximize what it is that we paid for, right? We paid for good cyber coverage. We wanna make sure that we're describing things in a way that really maximize our coverage options and get us the things that we need, right? The other thing I'll mention, and I wanna open it up for some questions, is that um, you know, there's a lot of talk, and you, many of you as in the security sector have probably seen you know, CISOs being sued, right? Um, and, and ending up in lawsuits. Your cyber insurance isn't gonna be necessarily what comes into play in that setting, right? You also wanna make sure that you are involved in the director's and officer's policy, right? The D and O policy, as they call it. You wanna make sure that you um, have the right folks in the room um, and are listed really on that policy for coverage so that if you do get sued, if you're the CISO, um, that you are getting uh, your legal fees paid for out of that DNO coverage, right? Because that's, that's an important concern versus out of your pocket. So we have about five minutes left. Are there any questions? I think I see one over there. Yes. However, our uh, premium doubled right. in the last year. Now I'm renegotiating and I'm, I'm looking at other companies and whatever. But I've heard that there may not even, due to what's going on over in Europe, right. there may not even be cyber insurance available. I know Chubb is getting quite uh, tight. Reluctant. That's exactly right. I see the market continuing to come in tight. I will tell you this morning I was looking at, there was a Marsh report that came out, Marsh McLennan being kind of one of the large insurance brokerages, um, and they actually said, um, I'm not touching this, it's moving forward here. Um, they actually said um, that, and that's what's been going on the entire time we've been talking. Um, they uh, say that they think that the market is actually coming in a little bit, um, uh, a little bit, kind of landing a little bit softly right now with regards to premiums, right? Because we were seeing this, this kind of doubling of premiums like you're describing and that had started to slow down a little bit. I think you're right. I think you know, a lot of these folks, if you're not um, familiar with it, you know, the process, like Lloyd's is a syndicate, right? There are people, you know, it's, it's kind of pri there are folks that engage in that process. I think that um, the market is gonna continue to tighten, and I think that we need to be prepared with other kind of risk mitigation strategies, to your point, you know, considering whether we run, you know, depending on how big our organization is, you know, do you run a captive program? Which is to say, do you kind of build your own insurance model within the confines of your organization? You may not have the financial strength to do that, but you put that on the 10-year plan that we're gonna get out of the commercial market, or we're gonna reinsure in the commercial market, but we're gonna take on some of this risk, maybe set aside you know, 20, 20 million or whatever as a rainy day fund to handle our cyber risk. So I think the market is gonna to continue to get tight and that we're gonna to have to get creative, right, in how it is that we address these particular risks. Next question. Thank you, great presentation. Question about, you talked a little bit about external scanning, for example, as part yes. of the application process. We're starting to see more regular, you know, living uh, activity with cyber insurance companies with their policyholders. Do you see that becoming more of a trend? You know, are there gonna be limits to that? Or yes. do you think it's kind of where it is today? I think it's gonna, I think underwriting is gonna to continue to get creative with regards to what it is that they're gonna do. I think that we're gonna get more and more scanning. I think we're gonna get more and more in-depth questions because what they're attempting to do is mitigate their risk, right? For a long time, they didn't have the right experts necessarily asking the right questions. I mean, maybe they, a few of the carriers did, but a few didn't, right? Now we're starting to see these very extensive applications like we were looking at where we're getting into, and frankly, you know, if we're listing out the kinds of like EDR tools that we're using, for example, or you know, where we're hosting things or who's providing these services, now the underwriter is looking and saying, frankly, almost getting to the level of judging our vendors, right? And so, you know, also are you looking at these applications and thinking about, uh, my EDR tool isn't on this list. Maybe I need to pick something on the menu so that I kind of play to that system. So I think that, again, I think we're gonna to continue to see this. I also think we're gonna to continue to see sublimits um, and exclusions related to various things. You know, ransomware getting sublimited down. Um, and how do we then, again, build what it is we need uh, into our kind of, um, our planning in advance, right? Uh, you know, again, maybe we don't need the notification coverage under the policy, but we really wanna maximize our business interruption under the policy. Maybe we'll pay out of pocket for this portion of something versus going through the policy, things like that. Other question? Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, yeah. 
this is actually a question related to what you just were mentioning. It's insurers as almost gatekeepers when it comes to like vendor selection. And it puts, I think, the market in a really interesting position because it's basically saying insurers are becoming a standard right. bearer of sorts, right. not our regulators, not our internal, uh, I guess, budgets. How How is this tension playing out? Because it feels like something that insurers, their standards could almost feel arbitrary at times. And so how are they even like setting the expectations for what is your tool use right. and compliance? Again, I think that I think we will continue to see that really kind of pushing things forward. I, I, don't, I think that it's really, it's kind of, I mean, I, I don't want to say, again, I'm not, I don't work for any insurance carriers. I'm just a random lawyer here on the stage telling you my thoughts. But, you know, I think it's a little bit of a kind of a crapshoot, excuse my language, on it in terms of what they put on that list versus what they don't put on that list. And that's why I really highly suggest that you try to describe if your stuff is not on that list, that we say, this is what I have, and you may not be familiar with this tool, but it's a leading you know, X, Y, and Z, right? And we utilize X, Y, and Z, and this is why we're in a strong posture. And then ask to get on the underwriting calls, ask to get in and be able to explain yourself so that you can really make a case for why you should be insurable. Another question? Yeah, thank you very much for your presentation. And uh, this is very relevant to what I'm going through right now. Um, on Tuesday, I'll be standing before a bunch of insurers who wants to uh, scrutinize our process and stuff like that. Right. Now, the broker has facilitated this, and you said something like, if you're which of and you want to negotiate with them that, okay, for example, AIG is going to do this for me, so are you ready to do that? Now, right. my broker is bringing all the insurers together. Exactly. And br bringing me before everybody at the same time. How do I negotiate? Right. Well, I think that's a great question. I think really you got to push your broker because again, the broker should work for you all, right? At the end of the day, the broker gets a gets a gets a kind of piece of that, right? There's a fee that they receive when you place this amount of insurance, and so ask the broker and say, what are the options, you know? And then also make sure that your broker is really uh, the right broker for the job because the other issue that you sometimes see is that some brokers are not the cyber experts and they're bringing in somebody else or they're there's somebody behind the scenes that there's is their cyber person right sitting in chicago and they're sitting here in dc you know you want to make sure you're on the phone with the right people so that you can really get the right results but i would say you know make sure that you have an advocate in that process um, and again potentially engage outside counsel to be involved to assist because you know outside counsel my my duties under the ethical duties are to you as the client the broker has kind of this interesting divided duty a bit right with regards to their duties of loyalty to some of the carriers and things that they may be placing and so again i'm not i just suggest to you that you want to make sure you have somebody who has kind of a duty to assist you fully Are there any other questions hi beth good afternoon uh my question is, on, after the binding has occurred, if there is a vendor that we're interested in doing business with who's not been identified on the panel, do you have any experience or guidance on what we should do in, the, in that circumstance? It's worth attempting to ask, right? Again, I guess I kind of fall in the sense of like, I will be embarrassed and ask the goofy question, um, even if it's not the right time to ask it, if it's going to be something that benefits my client, right? So if we think that it's something we can potentially do, You've got a better chance at the time of binding to get that, that which you want, but why not try, right? At least go ahead and ask your broker, is there a possibility of, of amending this? Is there a possibility of going ahead and trying to add these folks in? It's worth a shot, right? All they can do is say no, and then at least you know, and again, the team, the risk management team, the legal team, the IT security team, everybody needs to be on the same page also about the vendors that we want to utilize, right? who it is we want to engage and why we want to engage them because what we want to do is maximize the coverage under the policy but also make sure we have the right experts in the room. Any other questions? Oh. <laughs> Sit on the wrong side. <laughs> Aside from uh, pushing the broker, um, how you're saying, any other ways you see the cyber insurance industry being disrupted? I think the more we have these startups, there's a lot of startups kind of coming into the space. You see kind of newer, less, um, like cowbell insurance is an example of somebody coming into the market, right? I think the more we see some of these uh, specialty carriers coming in, I think that's gonna continue to disrupt and move the market in a certain direction. For a long time, it was really the Wild West because 
the market uh, was not stabilized. It's not like property insurance, right, that's been around for like 600 years and everybody knows what's going to be covered or not covered. It was kind of everybody had their own policy and form. It's starting to stabilize now, but I think the more players come in from a startup perspective, the more that's going to continue to make it and drive it forward. Other question? Um, yeah, I just wanted to hear your thoughts more on like war exclusions um, and if you think attribution is something that will help or harm the industry. I think that attribution is going to harm the industry candidly because um, really a lot of these war exclusions, when you dig into them, what they say is if a, if a government has come in, let's say that um, you know, something hits Ukraine, for example, very real life example, something hits Ukraine and then the US government says this was Russia with this particular incident. The language of these war exclusions says, if it has been attributed to a state actor, you're out, right? And so um, I think attribution is really going to kind of continue to limit what it is, um, the exposure, really, frankly, for these carriers. Any other questions? Thank you for the presentation. Um, along those lines, there are there's an increasing number of nation state activity being outsourced to private entities. So right. is it better to hold those cards close to the vest in the situation, like if you are experiencing compromise, do you have an obligation to disclose? You know, I think that there, I think my, my instinct again, being in the kind of being in the trenches with you would be that unless we're asked, we don't have a duty to disclose, right? I'm not trying to be the shady lawyer, but I'm here to protect you, right? I'm not gonna go and be a Girl Scout and volunteer and be like, hey, we think it's X, right? Um, if we don't have a duty or we haven't been directly asked that question. So that's something I would keep close to the vest. And again, I, I would suggest to you that in the process, as you're kind of engaging in that process, um, you want to make sure that we are not speculating, right? That we don't, if we don't know exactly what it is, the variant that we're dealing with, especially with ransomware as a service these days, we don't know who's, who's who, right? It could be two dudes in a basement, you know? So we want to make sure that we're not really trying to draw those direct lines and put ourselves at risk of having the policy get jeopardized. The other thing I'll state is that, again, some of these policies, and, and I'm not trying to suggest you can't trust panel, counsel, or providers, but you need to remember that at the end of the day, you know, these panel law firms, for example, they receive, you know, $10 million worth of business from Chubb, right? Or $10 million worth of whatever it is, pick your poison on your number. They're high volume dealers. And so they are coming in and they're ethically required to represent you, but they may have a bit of a divided loyalty. And so you want to make sure that you are also examining things with a separate set of eyes. Um, you want to share information with your panel counsel and you want to be engaged with them, but you want to remember kind of just in the back of your head, wait a minute, you know, they've got 600 open matters with Beasley, and I'm only one of those, right? Thank you. Hey, would love to hear your thoughts. On, like, we don't have an insurance company problem, like lack of carriers willing to take on this risk, but what I'm seeing is that we have a reinsurance right. problem, lack of reinsurers in, in the space. Would love to hear your thoughts on you know, what you're seeing out there, are, are there some more players coming into the space? I think that there are some more players that are starting to move into the space. Again, I think we're starting to see folks, I saw one even a couple of, uh, like on LinkedIn, announcing a, a week or two ago, hey, we've just set up a $300 million captive in the Caymans, you know, and we're, we're ready to now take on expanded risk, right? You know, I think reinsurance is going to continue to be a concern, and I think that you're also going to see a lot of this, um, you know, you're even seeing with some of these insurers that they, the, they may be also white labeling that first level, and they're really not the first level. You know, it's, it may be that you're not really dealing with Chubb. You know, you're actually dealing with another provider. So these are, these are things that I think are going to continue to sort out in the market. Hopefully the market is going to continue to stabilize, but to the earlier question, it's also just possible that with the... Um, economic uncertainty right now that it's going to be a bumpy ride for a while. And so what can we do, you know, from a front end, from a preventative end to make sure we're not having to tap into this? And then also are we working with our finance teams, like our CFOs and those folks about, okay, do we have slack space built into the budget in the event that we had one of these issues occur, right? Because cyber insurance may not cover everything. We may not want it to cover everything. We may be taking on certain costs or making certain determinations outside of that. So how are we making sure we have a rainy day fund related to these types of issues. One last question. One last question. All right. Uh, sorry to be the one before lunch uh, standing between. Uh, Beth, you just mentioned about, uh, you know, 
out-of-date software and the implications of that. Uh, one of the things I want from a, uh, in transfer insurance, like or uh, ensuring that your third party, like you know, when yes. you are when you are uh, engaging with third party, you don't have control over them, right. and they try to push it out. Right. And at the end of the day, your clients, so even the federated reg regulatory agencies, they are looking at you to plug that gap. Yes. You make your insurance. You cannot say like you cannot take the line that they, it's not my fault; it's their fault. Right. How do you ensure that the transfer of that risk? is covered and insured from a third party perspective? Well, you really want to make sure, that's an excellent question, and you really want to make sure that you are really analyzing your information security addendums, right? If you're, hopefully you have those in place or your data processing addendums that are being attached to your contracts, right? And then making sure that that process is really robust, right? That you're requiring your vendors to carry five, 10, whatever it is, amount of insurance based on the nature of the risk, but then also having risk management review that insurance as it comes in, especially if there is a request to deviate from that so that you know, like, wait a minute, this particular um, third-party vendor is gonna have a VPN connection into our manufacturing equipment, perhaps through an IoT device or otherwise. It's really a mom and pop shop and they only have one million in cyber insurance, but they have a complete uh, kind of access to our entire kingdom. And if they took down our manufacturing line with ransomware through them, what are we gonna go back on, right? So you wanna make sure that you really are passing that risk and doing that risk transfer as best you can and making sure that you are having very strong conversations with your in-house legal department about, you know, if you don't understand what it is this particular contractor does for us, then please pick up the phone and call me in security and I'll talk you through it so that you understand what it is that, you know, the risk that you're accepting, right? The other thing I'll mention just in closing is that in the underwriting process, we're also starting to see this third party risk and uh, questions related to, do you have contracts uh, with your vendors that are robust? Do you have indemnification clauses? Do you require cyber insurance of them? That's part of the process. So it's a great question because supply chain is gonna also, I think, play into you know, some of the questions that the, that the group has had related to what's gonna be insurable going forward. So, so thank you very much. Uh, my contact information is in the app and you're welcome to reach out. I love to geek out about this and uh, talk offline about these types of issues anytime. So thank you.